Uh, okay, this is a fun one. Uh, it'll probably be even more fun the title, but customer success is a single digit higher. Um, this is a theme that we've chatted a lot about. I screwed this up, everyone screws this up, um, and I think there's a, there, there's a couple reasons for it. Um, and I think we'll hear a few, a few case studies from Nicole and the panel here. But if you're, if you're early stage, or even if you're not in the single digit, even if you're the double digits, uh, especially these days, a lot of first time founders, a lot of driven founders think they can hack customer success longer than they should. Um, the simple answer is make sure it's a single digit hire. Don't get to more than nine employees before you hire a customer success lead. Um, but whatever you do, make sure that the CEO, the founders, the executive team is not hacking this function just because they know the product longer than they should. Uh, best case, you'll hit a wall. Your CEO cannot be the head of customer success for more than a handful of customers. Best case, she or he will be spending 10 or 20% of their time, not 100%. And all of this second order revenue, all this hard work will be impacted. Um, and my one takeaway hack, and then I'd love to hear more from Nicole and the panel is, the key is, as folks know, is it doesn't have to be perfect. If there's CEOs and folks here, you don't, the CSM, your first couple CSMs can just love and be passionate for, for the product and software. Um, it's far better to have someone that's passionate, that understands your products and love customers, managing your first half a million or million or two million revenues than having no one there. This is, at least in the early days, a generalist, a liberal arts major can do just fine if they have passion for what you're doing and some experience. Um, so with that, let me bring out uh, Nicole from Lightspeed who will introduce our panel and we'll do, we'll do a deep dive on the early hires. Hey. Hey. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Nakul. Uh, I'm an investor at Lightspeed Venture Partners. Uh, we are lucky to be involved with Gainsight, so really excited to see how far the conference has come and how far the industry has come. Um, so customer success as a single digit hire. Um, Jason talked about why it's important to be a single digit hire, invest early in customer success. But uh, at the same time, being, being, your being the first customer success hire in the company is not easy. Where do you even start? Um, what kind of processes do you set up? How do you, you, you're running into this firefighting every day around managing churn as the only customer success hire. How do you manage your day to day while also setting up some institutional processes for it to scale? So that's kind of the topic that we'll tackle today. Uh, we have a great panel for you. Uh, we have Blair Fernandez from TalkDesk. Blair. Um, we have Jennifer Bantelman from Zuproved, and then we have Katie Rogers from Salesloft. So uh, we'll address three topics today, three questions, really. Um, what processes can you set up as, your, as the first customer success or one of the early customer success hires? Um, how do you go beyond day-to-day -day firefighting? Uh, and the third is, what productivity hacks can you use if you're on a low budget? Trust me, if you are one of the first customer success hires, it's a startup, you want to be lean and mean, uh, you probably don't have a big budget, so this is as important as anything. Um, so, you know, uh, Blair will take over the first topic, so I'll hand it over to her right away. Hi, everyone. Uh, just so I have a, a sense of who's in the audience, how many of you are your first company's customer success hire? Okay, a good bit. Great. So, you know, as, as Jason said, the bar is, is pretty low. I'm a fine arts major. I came from sales. I knew nothing about customer success. But my goal was to make sure that I did the right things in year one, that as TalkDesk grew, I would actually stay and, and get to continue leading the team. So what I'm going to walk through are some things that have worked out pretty well for, for TalkDesk so that, yeah, you can be that customer success hire who's, who's starting from scratch where the bar is low, but hopefully you're putting something sophisticated together so that you can, you can see through uh, the end of the work that you're doing and actually continue to lead the team as the, as the company scales. So first of all, we, we thought about what experience we want our customer to have. And the first thing was we don't want our customer to have to repeat themselves. When they go through the sales process and they outline everything that matters to them, why they're buying TalkDesk, what their goals are to the AE, and they close and they talk to their CSM 
and they have to start from scratch with that same exact you know, litany of reasons why they bought, that makes them feel like they're not valued, that no one's listening, that no one cares. So we put in place a, a sales to success handoff document. And in addition to some mandatory input fields that we put in a sales force, we said, okay, you know, what, what can you get from an interview that's beyond you know, some simple inputs? So some of those things are like, what's the relationship like between our champion and their superior? Do they have a good relationship? Is the champion really taking a risk by buying TalkDesk? Is their job on the line with whether we succeed or, or we fail? H how much does this matter to them? Uh, what are the goals that they have? What are the KPIs that they track? That way when you, when you come into that kickoff call, you've got some substance. You've got something to talk about. So this, this handoff has, has gone really well excuse me, gone really well, and uh, it's, it's working so far. And then the, the next step in the, the customer journey is that actual kickoff. And so we said, okay, you know, what, what are the things that we want to instill? Well, I mean, it's customer success. You want to drive retention. You want to drive growth. So let's, let's keep selling. Let's let our customers know during that kickoff call that they're not our largest customer, that they might have bought us for support, but hey, you know what? We work with sales teams, and we work in, in hybrid situations across companies where TalkDesk can be the end-to-end -end solution. So while you might not know, you know everything that TalkDesk can do throughout the sales process, we're going to show you starting from day one what's possible and how we can help grow in your account. Uh, the next thing that, that we focused on was the onboarding. So everyone I talk to seems to have a, a different idea of how involved customer success is in onboarding. At TalkDesk, we have a separate team, professional services, who manages this onboarding. But we ended up over time in this, this nebulous phase of whose responsibility was what and which check-in is the CSM versus the you know, implementation team. So finally we said, okay, time out, let's get really granular. And, and this flow chart you see in the middle picture, it looks pretty sophisticated. I, I guess it is actually, I mean, credit where credit's <laughs> due. <laughs> We've done a good job building it out. But we, we, we got super granular and said, okay, at this phase of implementation, what's the documentation that professional services is sending out? Who's sending the email to the customer? Who is scheduling the meeting? So it was just very clear to both teams who's doing what. And that's been, that's starting to create a, a really solid onboarding process. And we're now checking NPS as, or CSAT, I should say, as a result of the onboarding. So we're going to start to have data around that, which is going to drive customer health. Um, the next thing that we do is around go live. So this, this was pretty cool. We said, okay, what are customers excited about, concerned about, fearful about? at each stage of their journey with TalkDesk, and how can we plan our process accordingly? And one thing that we realized was that there's a ton of anxiety around the go live. You know, either a sales leader or a support leader has bought TalkDesk, it's, you know, they've, they've gone through the, the implementation, it's all ready to go. Now they need to make sure that it's working for their team. And there, like I said, tons of anxiety around that. So we thought, you know, what can we do to help decrease this level of anxiety? And one of the team members came up with office hours. Let's set up a series of office hours throughout Go Live Week where both our champion, who's sort of the administrator, can check in, the agents and the, the sales reps can actually check in and ask any questions that they have and make sure that they're answered immediately in real time. And this has helped tremendously. Um, at first I was thinking, oh great, you know, they'll, our, our team's just gonna be wasting time, they're gonna be sitting on a go-to meeting and no one's gonna show up. I mean, they're, they're packed. They'll say, well, you know, I, I allotted an hour for office hours today and I was there for three hours and everyone had questions, everyone's engaged. So it, uh, it, it was really a good concept that we're gonna keep doing. Um, so I would, I would encourage that. After go live, the customer transitions into maintenance mode. So, you know, as you know, you do your EBRs, you figure out how you handle renewals, which obviously everyone handles differently. We thought about what our customers want to know in the EBRs and what we want them to know. So, goal, you know, the, the foundation for driving retention and growth is value, right? Everyone needs to see value in your product, value in your tool, 
value in connecting with your team. If you have phone calls with customers and they're not getting value from you, they're not going to show up for that next check-in. There's no impetus for them to spend their time unless you are bringing something to the table every single time you meet them at every single touch point. So we focus on you know, the ongoing check-ins, the executive business reviews. What kind of data can we show them that we can then, they can then use to make an impact in the way that they do their business? So for us at TalkDesk, a lot of that is around benchmarking their data to their peers. So, you know, what I'm showing in the, the top right, right hand side, is a, a temperature gauge. And we've got average time in the queue and average speed to answer. You know, how much time are your customers spending, or your callers waiting, spending to talk to an agent? How, how quickly are your agents picking up the phone? These are important metrics in the, in the call center space. Obviously, you'll have your own, but giving them a sense of how they're doing, you know, on a red to green basis. And then we'll have at least three takeaways. Okay, so you're in the red. What do you do about that? Your customers are spending too much time in the queue. Well, okay, great. I mean, horrible, but so what do I do now? Well, you can add, add more agents to your team. You can train them or incentivize them on the right metrics so that they're picking up the phone as quickly as they can. You can you know, outsource, maybe you should consider that if you don't want to scale the team as quickly as possible. Now you're starting to have a real conversation. Now you're, the CSM is establishing himself as a real partner. Those are the kind of conversations that get your customer to keep answering the phone and maybe to even call you when they're faced with a business decision. So I think you know, that's my advice with, with the EBR is really think about how you want to position yourself as the CSM and then drive your EBR around that. You know, make sure you're providing the type of value and creating the type of relationship that you want to have. Uh, and then the last piece is around the cross-sell, renewal. We've chosen to reach out to customers 85 days before renewal. It gives a couple of weeks to get everything scheduled, bring in the executive, and then you're holding that EBR two months before the renewal. So if there are any issues, or there has been a change in the procurement process and acquisition, then you've got time to be able to solve those issues, deal with any, any situations, and uh, not have any excuses for getting the renewal. Uh, and so the, what, I'm, what I'm showing in the, the bottom right is actually an org chart that we've started to use uh, that maybe I should have scrubbed the data on, but hopefully you can't see it too clearly. <laughs> but um, we look, we look not just at our customers' org charts, but we actually map ourselves against it. So, okay, who's our champion and who's bridge to them? CSM has a great relationship with the champion, great. What about the champion's boss? Does the CSM have a relationship with them? I hope so. If not, do I have a relationship with them? Do we loop in our CEO to meet with their CEO? Let's think about where we want to go strategically with this company and make sure that we're aligning the right relationships internally to drive those types of discussions. Uh, so yeah, so year one, you know, I, I probably should have started with this, but I came from a sales background. So in enterprise sales, it's all about medic and these processes that you go through. So that's, that's kind of what I knew, and that's kind of where I started off for year one. Looking back, I would not have done it differently. I think focusing on process is a really great way to handle that, that year one um, just that year one time that you have. That way as you onboard new CSMs, everyone knows exactly what they're supposed to do. Now they iterate, they contribute, we change the process all the time, of course, but at least they've got some legs to stand on to, to get rolling with the customer experience. All right. Uh, great, uh, so Blair, you talked about, you know, being the first CS hire, uh, setting up this process. Uh, can you also talk about how did you think about scaling your team? How much ARR per CSM in the early days? Did that change over time as it became more process oriented? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we started off trying to manage about 80% of our revenue. So, you know, the old adage that everyone adheres to, top 20% of your customers bring in 80% of the revenue. And so we, we set a revenue benchmark in the sand. We didn't ever change that, mm. and we need to. Right now, we're, we're probably managing 90% of the revenue, which is, is way too much. So it, it's time to go back and refine the model and change it a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the way that we, we started off with that benchmark. Was there another part to that question? You know, it was more around ARR per CSM and did that evolve? Yeah. Or, so like how, much, how many renewals can a person handle on a daily basis? I guess it 
relates to the ASP also a little bit, right? It, it does, but the way that we look at it, really the ARR, again, constantly iterating as always, but we, we initially had two groups of CSMs, so we managed between uh, $10,000 in ARR that, that customers would bring into TalkDesk to 50,000, so that was one group, and then we had another group of CSMs for above 50K. That worked well for a while, then we created three tiers within that group. Mm -hmm. Now we know we need to hire a one-to-many CSM mm -hmm for the under 10,000 group and do some kind of group model for the 10 to 20K. So, I mean, you can sort of see yeah. the, the stages that we're going through, but it's, um, it's probably gonna continue evolving in that way. Right. So because of those different tiers, ARR is different for every CSM. Um, and you know, if we get one huge logo or huge customer, then a CSM will just focus on them for a while to make sure we do it right. So uh, unfortunately, right now, it's more of an art than a science. Um, I'd like that to change this yeah. year, but right now, it's, it's, it's not quite as scientific as I'd like it to be. Right. Um, Jason or uh, Katie, Jennifer, any comments on this piece around process? Well, I think an interesting question is, so you, when you, you, you came into TalkDesk and there was very little infrastructure, but a lot of revenue, relatively speaking to, to probably some folks here, right? You come in and the company's got millions of revenue. So were you able to implement all of this? Was a staged approach? And how is it different when you come in late? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, that's a right? great point. I was Getting definitely late. Right, I was late to the game. Yes. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we, we did this in, in one year. What we started off with, I'm trying to remember the exact order of operations. What we started off with was the, the customer kickoff. We knew we had to have meetings with customers and set the stage for what their relationship would be like. So we you know, put together a kickoff deck, then we started to get smart around the, the handoff process and what information we'd need from customers. So that we started with Salesforce mandatory inputs and then I said, hold on, time out. I can't forget everything I've learned in sales. We need to have a personal touch here. There's, there's more that we can glean from the AEs. So that's when we put the handover in place. Um, then the executive business review, when we thought about you know, the goals during that time, what value we wanted to drive for our customers. So we, got, we started to get smart around metrics there and mapping out the organization. And then the last things were the, the um, implementation process where we define the CSM's role versus the professional services role. And then most recently was the, uh, the go live office hours, uh, which are pretty cool. They're, they're working pretty well. So it, it, it wasn't as linear as the slide suggests. I mean, you're sort of taking, taking down the most critical thing first, of course, but we, we've gotten there. Slowly. Great. Um, so with that, let's hand it over to Jennifer, who runs uh, customer success at Zapproved. Uh, Zapproved sells e-discovery software to corporate legal teams. I guess you were the first customer success hire. And how many people in your team now? Uh, we have just about a dozen now okay, uh, right. across uh, four CSMs. And then we also do implementation. Uh, we do training. And we do support all within the customer right. success org. Awesome, so yep. I'll hand it over to you and take it away. All right, thank you. Um, when I started, I, I was not a CSM, I was customer success. My business cards for a long time just said Jennifer Bantelman, customer success on them. Uh, and that was really indicative of, of what I did. It was essentially just anything that the customer needs, you need to do. And you also need to make sure that you're talking to the right person internally in order to glean that knowledge. Because when one person is managing all of the accounts before customer success starts, there's not going to be a lot of process. There's not going to be a lot that's written down. It's going to be in people's heads. So I find that at the first customer success person is probably going to be dealing with just a, an information gap where somebody knows something about the customer and you need to find out who and you need to get that information. But there, the biggest problem is really your time, right? How many of you have those meetings that you, you meant it to be an hour, but suddenly you're spending two or three hours on a project? Happens to everybody, right? Um, so how do you make sure that you're building your day in such a way that you are able to better justify customer success, build out as a team, so that you're really able to, to highlight the value and make them really glad that they brought you on board? And 
I think the best thing to think about is that it's really exciting to be the first customer success person. It can be really, really stressful sometimes, and it can feel like all you're doing is putting out one fire after another after another, but you have so much opportunity. It's very, very easy to execute change when you are the only person you have mm. to convince. <laughs> so every person that you add to your team is going to increase how much effort it takes to do that change management, but it's not even change management when you're doing it for yourself. So really look at it as an opportunity of how do I want this to look? How would I want to be treated as a customer? And what is gonna bring value to my company? So really think of it as, it's, it's really threefold. It's what's gonna make you happy, what's gonna make your customer happy, what's gonna make your company happy, not necessarily in that order. And really the earlier you do it, and at least start that process, the better off you're gonna be and the more fun you're gonna have doing it. So that's all well and good, but where can you actually focus? So the first thing is, Focus on what you're already doing. What are you finding is taking a bunch of your time? So you might be doing EBRs, right? And trying to get customers that are not used to EBRs because you're the first customer success person, trying to get them used to and get them interested in talking to you on the phone. Mm -hmm. How are you doing those reach outs? Write up a really good email and save it somewhere and just start using really basic templates for things that you find yourself writing over and over to start. Focus on the areas that you're already doing and just make it so that you're not having to rewrite things every time. Along with that, uh, you mentioned, but you don't have to be perfect. Uh, in fact, you're not going to be able to be perfect because you have too much to do. So focus on what you actually can do. You might not be able to make a perfect timeline of the customer life cycle. Uh, spoiler, you won't be able to do that. But focus on what you can do because every step you take is going to help you and it's going to make your life and the customer's life better. Also, make sure that you are taking advantage of your internal resources. So start a stakeholders meeting early with product. If you've got a sales team that's really heavily engaged, if you're a product heavy company, we're a, we're a product heavy company. So make sure that you're starting a good relationship with sales right away. Make sure that you're communicating with product because you are the voice of the customer. Even if you're the only customer success person, especially if you're only the, the only customer success person, make sure that you are communicating as that customer advocate internally. And then also, be a thought leader for your customers. Uh, we, we did not do this as early as, um, as I would have liked, but on, uh, on our product side, we did a bit, and customer success is taking on more of that now, but find out where there are gaps for your customers. How can they make their lives easier? How can they do their day-to-day? -day? Uh, we work in the corporate legal space. I am not a lawyer. <laughs> I don't know very much about law at all, but I do know about our software. And I do know, based on our customers, what their challenges are. So we strive really hard to put together actionable webinars, actionable emails and campaigns that are really going to help communicate to the customers in a way that's going to make their jobs better. And guess what? If you're doing a webinar, make it an open webinar that your customers can come to. Because then you can communicate to 10, 20, 30 percent of your customer base at once, and that comes back to what's repeatable. If you're able to do a one-hour webinar that touches 30 customers, you just saved yourself 29 hours. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Um, Jason or uh, other panelists, any questions or thoughts on that? One thing I'm curious, if, if, it's a great point when you come in, there, there's no tax, there's no overhead, you can define it yourself. Did you, did you define your own initial KPIs? Did your CEO define it for you? Or what did you, what did you figure out you should be accomplishing quantitatively? Uh, I'm lucky. Uh, our CEO really believes in the value of customer success. Yeah. So, um, so we've always been a direct-to-CEO report, which is wonderful. Mm. Uh, 
uh, I, I think that's incredibly valuable yeah. for a company. Um, but we did, uh, we did uh, MBOs to make sure that we had the, the right general picture. And that helped too, because that helps pull you out of the day-to-day -day if you have to have these, these larger quarterly pictures that you're trying to follow. But literally, one of my personal initiatives was extract data from our VP of products head. I, I, wanted, I wanted to kind of suck the knowledge out of him because he was, he was really our first CSM because he was building the product and getting feedback long before we had support or before we had customer success. Yeah. Blair, you had a question? I do, yeah. I saw in the first slide one of your points was around making sure you have fun. That's one of the three <laughs> key values of, uh, of the customer success team at Talk Desk. So what do you, what do, you do to, to keep having fun? Um, Make sure you believe in what you do, and if you don't, change it. But don't don't do things just because it's it's the way things are done. Make sure that you understand why you're doing what you're doing, and if you don't, get the information about it. Because customers can tell, especially in customer success, you don't want to be doing a job you don't like, because that's going to infect your team. But it's also your customers are going to be able to tell. Yeah. yeah. All right. Great. Thanks. Awesome. Well, uh, with that, let's. Uh, go to the last section, which is Katie's section. So Katie uh, was the first customer success hire at Sales Loft, yes. employee number seven. Mm -hmm. You've grown the customer base, or you've seen the customer base grow from, what, 70 to 2,000? Yeah, 72 so, customers when I first started, all yeah. the way to 2,000 plus now. So it's definitely been a journey. Awesome. So tell years. us about your story and how you cracked it. Cool. So I came to SalesLoft with a passion for sales and, and really got my job through Twitter. And that's an interesting story. I'd love to tell you about it later. Um, but definitely had a passion for sales and, and moved from a five-star corporate environment to a startup. And my whole family thought I was crazy. Uh, my father said, what are you doing? You're throwing your life away. And I said, Dad, chill out. I got this. Mm -hmm. um, and so in moving to SalesLoft, 72 customers, the first day running, first female employee. And uh, there are balls being thrown across the office, paper airplanes, and I said, okay, it's time to dig into this customer base. They're reaching out to a general support handle, so support at Sales Loft, and uh, we have product guys answering emails, and so the, the empathy drastically improved just the first day on the job. Um, and so when I started out, there was really no foundation for how our customers were operating. Our CEO, Kyle Porter, was running onboarding calls at the time, and that's what we called them. Um, and so from here, one of my biggest initiatives in coming on board and scaling out the team was, what are things that we can do you know, to, to ensure that we're not repeating ourselves, and what can we do at scale, right? Um, and so I had a rule of thumb that said, if we do something more than three times in a day, we have to figure out a better way to do it. And so today, I'm going to talk to you about four of the top tools that I had, wish I had, or found out about along the way that if I were to do this journey all over again, um, I would have used, and it would have helped us been more successful than we've been. Um, and so this was me when I first started. And so trying to eat as many chocolates as I possibly could and place them in the right place in the conveyor belt, and it just wasn't happening, right? And so as I started to build out the team and find the right tools to help me scale, I was like, that. Right? Everybody was so pumped. We actually had some kind of process. Things were working. There were less fires. Still there, but uh, you know, we were actually making moves. So totally hands all in, throw them up in the air, and we celebrated those small wins. And so one of the first tools I want to talk about today, um, and so these slides are not coming on correctly, so I'm just going to rock with it here. Um, so mouse light is the first tool. And so what you're going to see here is all day long, I was given presentations. And customers kept saying, Katie, where, where is the mouse? I can't see it. What's going on? And I was like, there's got to be a way to do this. This is happening on every single call. And so Mouse Light is found on the App Store. It's literally 99 cents. So shout out to Macklemore there. Um, but it literally will highlight a specific area on a screen share. So that way, your customers will know exactly where you're referencing on your screen. As soon as we put that up, it's probably the most asked tool that we have. Katie, where does that come from? What is that? And I said, well, it was 99 cents. Go on the App Store if you're using Mac, and you can have it instantly. The next was, this is a tool that I didn't know about, and it's a newer company coming out of Atlanta, but it's a company called TrustFuel. And so they specifically um, have a free net promoter tool. So when we first got started, we didn't have NPS. We implemented it in my first six months. It was really tough to do. Um, and so TrustFuel actually integrates into products very seamlessly. Everything can map back to Salesforce, and it's free. So if you're operating without a budget, definitely check them out. 
All right, the next was Calendly. So by a show of hands, how many of our CSMs or leaders in the room have booked an appointment with a customer and then had someone else come back and say, hey, I'm available at two, can we meet? And now you're double booked. All right, so a few of you have been double booked. For the few of you that didn't raise your hand, you are so lucky. Um, as you're growing and starting your, you know, your customer success efforts, I'm literally sending out, hey, can we meet at two, three, or four on Tuesday? Hey, can we meet at two, three, or four on Tuesday? And everybody wanted to meet at three o'clock on Tuesday. I was literally screwed. So um, Calendly allowed me to set up my schedule beautifully integrated with my Google Calendar, and they integrate with a lot of different calendars as well. Um, but where customers could go and select simple ways to book on my calendar. And so you can see in the GIF here, once it gets back to the beginning, select a 30-minute meeting, pops up where my availability is, pick a different time slot. I can have them populate in 10-minute intervals, 15-minute intervals, or hour intervals. So make it work for you. Own, you know, own your days. This is a step in the right direction here. And then with that, you instantly get a calendar invite on your calendar as well as your um, customer who's booking it. And so talk about a seamless approach. And I had no more double bookings. Um, talk about working smarter, not harder. And so the last one here, um, you know, I'm going to take a second to just shout out to SalesLoft. Um, Sales off cadence has been a huge value add. And so when you talk about streamlining your emails and reaching out to customers, we launched Sales Loft as it is today uh, in October of 2014 in beta. And the fact that I could send emails out to customers and have a systematic approach while being personable, because I am such a personable person, I wanted my, my personality, my charisma in there. And this was the first way that I could do it at scale. And so we helped build out workflows at a smaller scale. And as we've grown, we are uh, Gainsight customers now. But if we had that when I started my first day at SalesLoft, oh man, I would have been in heaven. Um, and so helping you build out those workflows and also seeing when your customers are clicking your emails, when they're opening them, you can see who's ignoring you or not. Let's be real, it happens sometimes. Um, and it also helped us, more importantly, stream a lot of our renewals as we were going. And so it helped me create a predictable process that was also personable as well. And so those would be my top four tools. If I was looking to start over again, I'd say sales off, move a little bit faster. I could have used that a year ago. Calendly definitely helped me remove the double bookings. Trustfuel was a free MPS tool. We should have done it sooner and not waited six months till I was on the job. And then Mouselight is a simple tool, and it really just helps from a presentation standpoint. If your customers, we're based in Atlanta, our customers are pretty much on the West Coast, so I can't do the face-to-face -face meetings. And uh, Mouselight just was a, was a lifesaver there. Great. Uh, Kitty, I'm curious as to, um, so these get you started. At what scale of number of, AI, uh, number of CSMs do you feel you start needing a full end-to-end -end customer success solution, whether it's Gainsight or one of its comp uh, competitors or whoever? Yeah, I think for every company it's a little different. Um, we grew in our first year 2,000%. In our second year in 2015 when I joined, we grew another 2,000%. Mm -hmm. So we were going very quickly. Yeah. Um, and there was one where we had phenomenal growth, but we did need the playbooks and, and yeah. uh, obviously the, the, the health scores and the churn risk and all that coming in proactively versus being completely reactive. Mm. And so um, for us, I think we're a unique case where we needed a little bit sooner. Uh, we were working off of two million books of business, <laughs> and so we read your blog, um, and, and we worked that, and for us, we have some really small deal sizes, and so the two million didn't quite scale out for us, and mm. so we're still revamping, and I think one thing to know as you're building out your process is you are constantly going to be tweaking and, and making small changes, so please don't want it and done it. If you are, we have to seriously talk, and I would love to check in with you later this afternoon, because I am changing something, and, and I've got Jason in the audience, Every month we're making small tweaks and we're constantly innovating and here we are, you know, going on my third year and it's still not perfect. It's not going to be perfect and I, I've accepted that and I am okay with that. Great. Uh, Jason or uh, Blair, Jennifer, any comments? I think it's terrific. Uh, my guess is eight. You can't hack it past about eight, yeah. eight, eight, eight folks on the team. Eight, eight as soon as you team. even contemplate hiring another manager yeah. or hi contemplate hiring folks that you're not going to train yourself, yeah. if you don't have great systems, when you stop training yourself, it will yeah. all, it'll all mm -hmm. fall off. The, yeah. I mean, four would be great, but I think eight, eight yeah. is the outer limit that, that we can yeah. hack it. And I'd say we got to about nine or ten 
when we started to look at a tool. Yeah. Um, and so it was, you know, something where we done, should we have done it a little bit earlier, probably yeah. with our growth? Um, but it, it's definitely been a game changer for us. And uh, yeah, and at some point, it, the cost, if the efficiency is even 20%, it starts like mapping up into a simple ROI of you add one more CSM or you could invest in the solution and scale up a little more of your existing team. Yeah. We actually did that at Zapproved. I actually um, decided to champion for uh, a health scoring instead of hiring another mm. CSM right yeah. then because we're getting to the point where I couldn't intimately know every single customer. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I wanted to be damn sure that the health <laughs> scores were, that I had some way of making sure that that yeah. my customers were healthy. You're absolutely right. I went from knowing every customer's name, their uh, their ARR, mm. a, little a little bit about their business, to being like, who, what, <laughs> huh? And uh, I mean, that was a, it was a scary moment because you know the the business really grew. It was wildly exciting on the on the other side as well. And so now I've learned to embrace that I'm not going to yeah. know everything and really rely on the process that we've built here three years later to help us out. Awesome. Well, we've run out of time, so unfortunately, we won't be able to take any um, audience okay. Q and A, but. This was great, thank you. Thank Super you for your panel. Cool.